Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Talks at Google virtual event. My name is Caitlin Venezia, and I'm a recruiter here at Google. I'm so excited that I have an opportunity to interview and learn more about the wonderful speaker that we have today. Before we get started, I do want to remind the audience that we'll be taking questions towards the end of the talk. So as you think of questions throughout the conversation, please feel free to add them to the live chat on the right. I am very excited to introduce today's guest, Dr. Pooja Lakshman. Dr. Pooja Lakshman is a psychiatrist, New York Times contributor, the founder and CEO of Gemma, the physician-led women's health, women's mental health education platform, and the author of a new book entitled Real Self-Care. She serves as a clinical assistant professor of psychiatry at George Washington University School of Medicine, and she maintains an active private practice where she treats women struggling with burnout, perfectionism, disillusionment, as well as clinical conditions like depression, anxiety, and ADHD. Her debut nonfiction book, Real Self-Care, a transformative program for redefining wellness, crystals, cleanses, and bubble baths not included, was just published by Penguin Life. Pooja frequently speaks, advises, and consults for organizations on mental health, well-being, and real self-care for employee wellness and for brand social impact initiatives. Her recent partners include Peloton, LinkedIn, The New York Times, 23andMe, Edelin, Pearson, McKinsey, and Memorial Sloan Kettering. Dr. Pooja Lakshman, it is my pleasure to welcome you to Talks at Google. Thank you so much, Caitlin. It's such a pleasure to be here. I'm so excited to be having this conversation with you. Thank you. Us too. Thank you so much. I There's so many different areas that I'd like to chat with you about today, but I think for our audience, uh, let's kick it off with, if you can just explain to us what you consider to be the difference between faux self-care and real self-care. Yes, absolutely. And first, I will also just hold up the book so everybody can see it. It's called Real Self-Care, like Caitlin said. Um, and the sub subtitle is crystals, cleanses, and bubble baths not included. So as your question suggests, I spend a good amount of time in the first half of the book really differentiating between what I call faux self-care versus real self-care. And the differentiator I use, or one of the differentiators, is that faux self-care is a method. It's something that you can use for a very specific period of time or a very specific problem, but it's time limited and it's also um, limited by the circumstances of what you're going through. Whereas real self-care is actual principles. It's this perspective. It's this 30,000 foot view and it's internal right? So methods or faux self-care are things that you can buy or things that you can check off your list. So whether that is like the bubble bath, the juice cleanse, the yoga class, um, the essential oils, right? That's all stuff that you can, um, it's, it's a noun, right? Whereas real self-care is a verb. It's a process. It's something that you have to actively partake in. It's not something passive that you can just consume or check off of a list. The other big differentiator is that faux self-care always keeps your relationships and um, kind of your, your ecosystem of your life, it always keeps it in the status quo. <laughs> Whereas real self-care is always going to shift the equilibrium of your interpersonal life, of your relationships, of your family system. And I know that that's scary, but that is the work of real self-care. Um, the other thing that I'll say is that uh, I'm not necessarily kind of like demonizing the yoga or the bubble baths or the massages. We can get into sort of how to differentiate, right? But it's all about the actual decision-making process that you take to get to the yoga class. Because for example, you could imagine one person's yoga class is 
actually really performative and more mm -hmm. aligned with faux self-care because maybe they go to yoga and they spend the whole time kind of like worrying about whether their crow pose or their headstand is good enough and whether they're wearing the right Lululemon leggings, right? Like that's a very outward focus practice of yoga. Whereas another person could have done the work of real self-care and we'll talk about what those principles are and be at yoga, understanding that they had to set the boundaries to get there, that they're using self-compassionate talk in the way that they practice yoga, that they understand what their values are and why yoga is so nourishing to them. That's a very different yoga class. So it's less about the thing and it's more about the process that you take to get there. The last thing I'll say on this, and I know I'm monologuing, I hope it's okay. Um, so I, I'm a psychiatrist two days a week taking care of patients. I've also been the founder and CEO of Gemma, which is, is the masterclass for women's mental health. Um, but I, over the past five or six years, have been um, doing freelance writing. So I write frequently for the New York Times. And a lot of my work for the Times has been focused on centering the systems of oppression. So I always say you can't meditate your way out of a 40 hour work week with no childcare. Like that's not how wellness works, right? But that's what we've been sold. But the actual problem is in the systems around us. Like we live in a country where 30 million Americans don't have access to health insurance, where a quarter of American workers can't take a paid sick day. So when you're telling in particular women to just like take a bubble bath and have a glass of wine, I find that to just be very condescending and frankly infuriating. infuriating. So that's kind of like the reasoning behind me writing this book, Real Self Care, is that like the problem is outside of us, but the solution, the solution has to be collective, but in order for the solution to be collective, we all need to understand that we have personal agency in how we come to the solution. Wow. Beautifully said. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate that. One thought that came to mind is, do you think that faux self-care can take us to real self-care? Yes, that is a great question. So what do I want to say on this? So in real self-care, one of the kind of interventions that I crafted is called the real self-care thermometer. And it's this quiz. It's actually one of those really fun. Um, I'm 39. So I grew up in a time where like where there was those Cosmo quizzes, like where we had actual magazines. Right. And you would take the quiz and find out your score. So the thermometer actually was a fun little exercise for me to go back there. Um, so you take the real self-care quiz and you can get three different colors. So green means that you're doing well, you're not burnt out, you're, you're having, you know, you have a decent real self-care practice. Red means that you're drowning. You really, really, really are not able to access real self-care and yellow is the middle ground, right? So what I find is that when you're red, like when you take that quiz and you score red, you usually, the only thing that you're capable of is the faux self-care because you just need the escape. Like making decisions feels way too hard and you kind of turn to whether it's the bubble bath, whether it is, you know, just anything that kind of like lets you zone out, that is sort of like your escape space. Um, in the book, I argue that we shouldn't beat ourselves up for that. And we can talk a little bit about my own personal history and journey. Um, I, I have a lot of compassion for folks that are in that space. Like I've been there. Um, I often go back there. Again, one of the tenets of real self-care is that this is a lifelong practice. It's not one and done. There will be times where life throws you curveballs. Um, and sometimes all you can do is go into that escape place. The problem, or, or maybe this, I would say like kind of the solution there is to know that you need that escape and that escape isn't going to fix the problems in your life. Mm -hmm. So you can take that escape, but not put the pressure on yourself that you're supposed to then be able to implement all the change, right? Like that you're using this escape, use that as you need to. Mm -hmm. And then once you feel like you've kind of, maybe wrapped your head around some of these principles, started to think about boundaries when it feels like something that's more accessible, then you can come to that. That makes sense. Yeah, that's helpful to know. And thank you for sharing also that you've been in those shoes as well. So it really resonates um, and you're speaking from a place of experience. So that makes it all the all the more wiser. So thank you. Why do you think as a society um, we are so seduced by faux self-care? 
Yeah. You know, um, as I was writing the book, it was really apparent to me that, um, that that's one of the biggest questions, mm -hmm. right? Because we do live in this, I think part of it is we live in a culture that really exalts the quick fix solutions mm -hmm. and the work of real self-care, these, the internal decision-making, all of that is, takes time, mm -hmm. right? Like any sort of lasting, quote unquote, wellness solution takes years and years to build up that practice and that muscle. But American society in particular really loves that quick fix. And, and again, I don't think that we come to it from a dishonest place. I think like life is really hard. Like there's so many stressors, you know, I, and I, I have a 10 month old son. I run a company. I have a private practice. I wrote a book. I'm doing a book launch, right? It's like, gosh, I just like keep collecting jobs basically. Um, I'm sure many folks on the call can understand and empathize like people that work at Google y'all are, um, let's say like, you're not uh, an underachieving bunch, right? <laughs> like, so we're constantly pulled at all sides. And I think American culture, again, really exalts the quick fix, also really exalts productivity, mm -hmm. right? And sort of like having the solution and, and sort of knowing the certainty, like this is the answer, as if there only is one answer, mm -hmm. right? And so one of the things that I talk about in the book is actually the reality that there is no one answer. There's actually hundreds of answers right? And you have to find yours and you will have multiple answers, right? Especially when you're somebody who is in that, if you score red, right? And you're kind of like in that dark hole and everything feels really hard and terrible. There's this fantasy that like, oh, I just need to find this one solution. I just need to find this one workout program, this one juice cleanse, like this one life coach, whatever. And that's going to be the thing that solves everything. When in reality, the thing that's going to solve your problems is actually hundreds and thousands of small decisions. Mm -hmm. And each little step will lead you to the next step. And that takes time. So, you know, I think it is interesting because as I've been, um, actually, after I finished writing the book, I have been reading Isabel Wilkerson's cast, um, which is a seminal, you know, work of brilliance. Mm -hmm. um, and it's especially interesting to me because as, um, you know, my parents are immigrants from India, so I'm South Asian American. It's interesting because obviously in, in India, like the word caste, it, like it's, I was interested to kind of understand about this. And I think that, you know, when we're talking about social determinants of health, right, when we're talking about systems of oppression, like we have to also talk about racism. We have to talk about the impact of capitalism, right? And I say this as somebody who founded a for-profit company, right? Like there's a way in sort of like the ecosystem that we live in, especially in America, where we're all kind of like turning and trying to get to sort of like the next sort of like aspiring to sort of like that next level. And, and we forget that actually the real meaning and the real good stuff is in slowing down and like really understanding what's important to you. Like, what do you really want? Like what, and that's going to be different than what your parents want for you or what your best friend wants. Right. And having the courage to actually slow down and then choose. Um, and that's, that's the hard part. And like no Instagram quote card can like do that for you. <laughs> so right. You're so right. Um, I'm glad that we were pivoting in that direction. So I, you had mentioned in your book that an important, uh, action step that we need to take uh, for self-care is boundary setting. So so many of us struggle with that. If you can shed a little bit of light on how do we recognize when our boundaries are being crossed? And once we do have that awareness, where do we even start of facing that and, and changing how we've been viewing these boundaries and our existing relationships? Yeah. yeah. Boundaries is one of my favorite things to talk about because everything starts with boundaries. And that's why principle one of real self-care is about boundaries. Um, so to your point, um, how do we know when our boundaries have been crossed? If you're somebody who's never had a boundary before, you probably won't know. That's what's step one, right? Like you even have to train yourself to understand, to know, yeah. right? So some of this like kind of, 
signs that you might start to pick up on are um, irritability, like that feeling. And this is what happens for me. If, if I haven't been setting boundaries when somebody in my life, whether it's my partner, whether it's a colleague, someone on my team, um, someone asked me for like the very smallest little ask, like, hey, can you like grab me a glass of water? I just like tense up and like, I just want to rage. And it's like the smallest little thing that's a sign to me like, wow, my level of distress right now at like a very small ask is completely out of proportion. Yeah. Yeah. That is a sign to me that I have not been setting my boundaries like mm-hmm. I need to be. Um, for other folks, it could be more around kind of like getting in that martyr mode, which I talk about in the book. So feeling like resentful that you are serving everybody else in your life. You're doing everything for everyone, your kids, your partner, your job, and nobody's looking out for you. And you're just like, gosh, doesn't anybody see that I am literally drowning? Like I'm so exhausted. Why doesn't anybody like offer to, you know, make dinner for me one night or to, you know, just give me some help. And like, you're waiting for other people in your life to step step in and save you as opposed to taking responsibility for yourself and setting a boundary and saying, Hey, no, I actually, I can't be classroom mom this week. I'm sorry. I can't, I have too much going on at work this week. Right. Instead of being the one to step up and make, make, take responsibility for your own decision-making. So getting to kind of like, how do we implement this or how do you implement boundaries in real self-care? I give a very specific example of sort of an aha moment that I had. So around boundaries. So this was in 2016. I had just graduated psychiatry residency and came on the faculty at George Washington University in the psychiatry department. And my mentor took me out for lunch and she gave me a piece of advice that was very shocking at that time for me. She was like, Pooja, you don't need to answer your phone. You can let it go to voicemail, listen to what they want, and then decide how to respond. And to me, I you know just finished medical school and residency, um, and at that time it was like, no, you you just answer your pages right away. Like that's just what you do. And so for her to say no, like you don't have to answer your phone, I realized, oh, your boundary is in the pause. It's the pause. It's that space in between. And then you can decide. You can say yes, you can say no, or you can negotiate. So a boundary doesn't always mean no, right? A boundary is the pause. And like just in this example, sometimes it would be the front desk and maybe they had paperwork for me to sign. And I could say, hey, I'll come around at the end of the day when I'm done with patients. Or maybe it's a patient leaving me a voicemail and say, and it's somebody that I know if she misses a day of her stimulant and she has ADHD, it's going to be really bad let me put that order in right away. Right. But it's the pause and then me using my judgment and that that's the boundary. And so that's the place, you know, in my clinical practice, I take care of all women. The majority of my patients are mothers, not all of them. Um, in that pause, like that's the hard part, right? Because you're so used to just reacting and just saying yes, even to stop and pause and ask a question, like just ask for more additional information. Um, so that's that's kind of step one of boundaries. And, and I do think that that is nice in that if saying no feels too hard, just practicing even the pause sort of helps build that muscle for you, right, over time. Thank you. I, I absolutely love that. And that makes me think of um, how hard it is to not feel the guilt after we set a boundary. And you talk about guilt quite a bit in your book. And I really liked when you said, practice putting guilt in the background. So if you can expand on that a little bit, what does that mean? And how do we do that? Yes, absolutely. So, so many of my patients um, are terrified of guilt, right? Like they just, every decision that they make in their life is to avoid guilt, Mm -hmm. right? And, um, and that's problematic, right? Because when you use guilt as your moral compass, you get so far away from yourself, that if you're not careful, one day you wake up after like a decade and you're just like, whose life is this? Like, I don't even know what any of this is, right? So um, so that's why I, I think about guilt. It's not, our goal is not to get rid of guilt because if your whole operating system is to get rid of guilt, then you're actually still paradoxically controlled by the guilt. So instead, the solution is to put guilt in the background. It's a feeling that's there. It's a thought that's there, 
but it doesn't have to be your moral compass. I think about guilt as like a faulty check engine light on your car dash. So, you know, like, you know, if you take your car in to get service and everything's great and you know, everything's fine, but then there's that blinking light on your dash that's just going and it doesn't actually mean anything. That's what the guilt is. It's just there. It's blinking. Nothing's wrong though. Like you don't have to drop everything and try and fix the check engine light, right? You know that it's not meaningful information. So you just kind of practice letting it be another feeling that's there. And I find that somewhat empowering too, because as if we kind of come back to the beginning of our conversation, like the fact that the reason we all feel so terrible is because of the systems of oppression and about how, and because our culture is not built for women or people of color or any type of marginalized group. Um, we feel guilt because of the contradictory expectations in our culture. So we internalize that. And then we mistakenly think that it's our own fault. And that's what the guilt is. And so that's why it's so important to recognize like, oh, when you're constantly feeling guilty, like this is actually like, this is noise coming from the outside. Mm -hmm. I don't have to, again, I don't have to drop everything and make this my moral compass. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And an important part of that is compassion too, which you talk about um, how it's important to have compassion for ourselves. So that makes me want to ask, how do we do that? Like a lot of us, I feel like have a hard time recognizing when we're not being kind to ourselves. Our self-talk you talk about in the book as well, being mindful of the way, the conversation that we're having with ourselves. So where do we begin in giving ourselves the compassion, the, the hug that we need and the positive self-talk that, that we need? Yeah. You know, it's funny when I first, maybe five or six years ago, when I kind of, um, you know, was thinking about self-compassion, like I, I always used to roll my eyes at the mm -hmm. word self-compassion because it always just kind of felt like it was like you were giving yourself, you were letting yourself off the hook, right? And maybe sort of some of the things that you see around like the affirmations or like, you know, the crystals, like it's all very like woo woo, you know. Um, but the conceptualization of self-compassion that I use in real self-care comes from the work of Dr. Kristen Neff, who is one of the foremost researchers of self-compassion. And it's actually based on um, a framework also that I reference in the book, um, ACT, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, um, which is all focused on essentially your relationship with your mind. So this idea that you are not your thoughts, like your mind is actually a separate entity. And so when we're talking about something like self-compassion, it's actually about recognizing that you can have a different conversation with yourself. For example, like here I am giving this talk and I'm just like, gosh, Pooja, wow, you're like droning on and on. You're like monologuing, like your voice sounds terrible. Um, right. And so I can say to myself, like, gosh, huh, ouch, ouch. Like, where, where did I learn to talk to myself like that? Like, would I ever talk to a friend like that? No, I wouldn't. Right. Um, and, and you can push back on those inner critical thoughts. Another great um, little takeaway tip from from ACT, from acceptance and commitment therapy is to and I know this sounds super silly. It's very silly, but it's funny, like in psychology, the silly stuff kind of it can work. So you can name that inner critic voice. So I, my, my inner critic is Angelica from Rugrats, oh, the God. older sister character. She's like very bossy and horrible. Um, I had a patient whose inner critic was on a tour from the Devil, Devil Wears Prada. Oh, my and, you know, one of the ways, one of the reasons that this is a nice, it's silly, but it's nice, but it reminds you that like that's not you. That voice isn't you. And there's so many other voices in your head as well. Like there's your funny, sarcastic voice. There is your, um, at Google in particular, there's your creative, like dreamer voice. There's your voice that's like super inspired, right? And so, yes, the inner critic is there. Same with the guilt, right? It's there, but it's just one piece. And it doesn't need to be the thing that's constantly, um, like it doesn't always have to have the microphone. Mm -hmm. One thing on compassion that I think is important in particular for this group is that, you know, if you are somebody who's high achieving, who's type A, who's kind of perfectionistic, not that I would know anybody like that at all, never. Um, but if you are somebody like that, um, sometimes it can be confusing. Like sometimes the distinction between your drive mm -hmm. and your inner critic can come up. 
Um, so in real self-care, I have little sections that are kind of like, sounds great, but, and it's sort of like the most common questions that my patients ask me. And it's sort of like, well, if I didn't have an inner critic, like, would I ever get out of bed in the morning? At the morning, would I ever be on time with any of my deliverables, right? Like, how do you kind of distinguish? And it's like, um, I'm not demonizing the drive, right? The drive is good. We all know like the research on stress, like there's a optimal level of stress, right? That can improve your performance, right? We all need a little bit of competition. The problem is when your inner critic is motivated by shame, like when it's mean, right? My cat Fifi loves to come on podcasts. And talk, so. <laughs> Love it. Right. It's like when you're mean to yourself and when you're cruel. And if you have come from a family where there was mental illness, where there was any type of kind of um, dysfunction interpersonally, whether where, where if there was um, addiction, right, then you might have grown up in a home where you internalized a cruel inner critic. Um, and that that's a place where therapy can be really helpful. You know, with real self-care, I actually include in every chapter, there's little sections that are like how to know when to seek professional help. Because as a psychiatrist, it was also really important for me to acknowledge that, you know, reading a self-help book is not therapy, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and there are a lot of different situations in which you need more, you need personalized support. And so I think that's an important caveat too. Yeah. Thank you so much. That's huge. Um, you also talk about in your book as one of the principles as aligning your insides with your outsides and getting clear on what your values are. Where is a good place for us to start in understanding what's important to us? What are my core values? Yeah, I think the hardest part of the real self-care work is the values bit. And that's why it's principle three, because first you have to do the boundaries you put in place some of the compassion and just, you know, for everyone to know that like this is like an ongoing process. It's not like you're ever going to be, you know, checking off like, oh, and I'm done. I know how to do boundaries now. Everything's fine. Yeah. Even as I'm on this book tour, like I'm having to relearn this stuff because it's a new environment for me, right? Every new role that you go through in life, you will have to kind of come back to these skills. But that's a good thing because each time you learn, you build the muscle and then it's easier with each round. But so for the values, you know, I think we, you hear the word values thrown around a lot, especially kind of in like the leadership world and sort of like different kind of professional spaces. Um, I find that when you ask people, what are my values? People either freeze up or they give you a response that's like very canned, like kind of like, oh, well, I really value my family. And it's like, well, yeah, of course, like we all value our families. That's, that's not helpful. Like, no. how do you value your family? Why do you value your family? Right. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of trying to get to the deeper thing. A value word is always going to be an adjective or an adverb. It can't be a noun. So you can't say like, I value my job. I value my career. Again, it's like, why, what about it? How, how do you embody it? So a value is something that you embody no matter if you meet your goals and no matter what situation you're in. So in real self-care, I uh, crafted these thought experiments um, that are basically just designed. They're not designed to tell you what to do. They're more just to ask yourself different questions. And so one of the ones that I really love in the chapter about values is this little thought exercise. Um, and again, it's indirect, right? Because it's easier to get to values when you're coming from it from like kind of like a silly, loose place as opposed to like a very serious, I need to figure this out. So um, imagine you have $200 to throw a dinner party for yourself. Um, what does that dinner party look like? Just imagine, right? And it's easy to see in that example that every single person on the planet is gonna have a completely different $200 dinner party. And there's no one right dinner party either. Nobody wins at the best dinner party. So are you somebody who you know, just like loves travel and loves, you know, exper exploration. And do you want everybody that comes to the party to like bring a dish from a different continent? Um, are you somebody who really values sort of like physical, like the physicality or maybe like it's something around music. So you want to like spend the $200 to like give your friend to pay your friend who has a, <coughs> has a band to play live music. And you want everybody just like dancing and up and like having a good time. Or maybe you really care about humor 
and silliness. And so you want everybody to like stand up and tell their favorite joke or you want it to be sort of a roast, right? <laughs> so just kind of like letting yourself go with that and imagine what it is and then see what are the adverbs and adjectives that stick out. And then like the work, the essential work of real self-care is threading those words through your whole life. So if something that comes up for you is something around like meaningful connection or intimacy, um, that's not just like, yes, you can apply that to your relationships, but you can also think about it in terms of your parenting. You know, maybe you, maybe that means that you also put in some thinking around how to spend more one-on-one -on -one time with each of your kids. Or maybe if you're in a workplace where a lot of your calls are big group calls, Maybe you want to make a shift and try and prioritize one-on-ones with people, right? Or if something around humor comes up as a value and like, let's say you're like an investment banker, like that's, that's not a great thing. Like maybe like, <laughs> maybe, I'm not telling everybody to like leave their jobs, but like more about like looking like, how does that align? Can you find a space where people don't take themselves so seriously, right? If you're somebody who really likes to be connected to that humor or that silliness. So, you know, it took a long time to get here, but um, real self-care is actually the decision-making work that is threaded through every single aspect of your life. So whether it's like who you choose as a life partner, whether or not you decide to have children, um, your career, what you do in your work, um, your free time and how much free time you have and what you do in your free time, real self-care lives inside all of that. It's not just taking 15 minutes out to meditate. It's actually inside your life in these decisions. And the way that you practice it is by really knowing your values and what's most important to you. Um, and again, and the other thing I want to say with that is that with every season of your life, it changes, it shifts. One of the things that I talk about in the book is I share my own personal journey about a decade ago, I left medicine. I left my, you know, I'm, I'm, like I said, my, my family is South Asian. I kind of did all the things that a good Indian girl was supposed to do when I was in my twenties. I went to Ivy league school. I, I became a doctor. I matched at one of the top residency programs in the country. Um, I got married. Um, and I found myself really burnt out and empty after that journey. Um, and so I blew it all up. I left my marriage. I moved into a commune in San Francisco that focused on female orgasm and meditation and sexuality and spirituality. Uh, I dropped out of my residency program. Um, and I spent two years with that group. And ultimately, by the end of it, I, I left very heartbroken and kind of realizing you can't outsource your decisions. And there's just as many contradictions and inconsistencies in the wellness world, for sure, as there are in mainstream medicine. I came back to medicine. But that's why the whole premise of real self-care is like there is no shortcut. There actually really is. It's just the hard work of making decisions in your own life. And, and I actually find that to be a hopeful message because it means that we actually have the agency in our own lives, especially, I think, for folks who are in a, at a place like Google and in a career that is really demanding. Um, I think there's a lot of overlap there between you know my personal experience in medicine, where you're somebody who really wants to do good in the world. And you really want to be, um, you know, you're, you're very uh, meaning oriented, right? And so when you're someone who is very meaning oriented, then actually really spending the time reflecting on what's most important to you and then having your decisions and your choices and how you spend your time and how you spend your energy and who, who is a part of your life, all that stuff, that's, that's the real self-care. That's the most important thing. That's the real work. Yes. 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 Yeah. Thank you so much. That was beautifully said. I, if anyone in the audience has questions, feel free to drop them into the chat on the right. I still have a few more that I'd love to pick your brain on. You had mentioned the last core principle, uh, assertion of power, right? So now we've done all the work and we're feeling we're at this place where we have our own power, our own agency, like you said, <clears throat> And I think you use the words own your headline or something like that. What does that mean? Own your headline. And how do we do that? Yeah. So, um, you know, I quote Audre Lorde in this book several times. And Audre Lorde is a black queer thinker who really put self-care as self-preservation on the map. 
And um, kind of coming back to the beginning of this conversation, again, this is betrayal, not burnout. The systems that we live in are what cause all the problems that women and minorities feel. Not that those are the only people that feel these problems. There's definitely folks that would not identify as a marginalized group who also feel these problems. And that's actually an interesting thing because I give talks quite often to different corporate groups um, and uh, everybody up and down the ladder <laughs> feels this, right? It's not just, you know, and so I think that's actually, again, I think that's actually, that's a point of connection, right? Mm -hmm. That we're all feeling this. And that tells us that the system is broken. Mm -hmm. So when real self-care is a personal solution and not a commercial solution, then you have the power to actually make a change in the system. And so here's an example. In, in my book, I share the story of a patient of mine who originally came to see me for her depression or her anxiety, which we got under control with therapy and medication. And then we were working through the real self-care process. And through that, she came to understand she had two kids at the time. And she was actually really resentful at her partner, her husband, because he had never taken a paternity leave. He actually worked at a small start. He'd worked in startups. He was always on really small teams, small companies, never felt like he could take the risk to ask to leave for a couple months, right? Um, so her real self-care was having really hard conversations with him. She got pregnant with her third baby and she was like, I am not doing this alone. I need you to take, they might say no, but I need you to try. Like, I need to know that you're actually on my team and that we're doing this together. And so he did. And they said, yes. And so um, every single person that then came to work at that company then got the benefit of having that paternity leave. My patient was not trying to be an activist or an advocate. Like she was just trying to not hate her husband and not get divorced. That was her motivator, right? So when we talk about power, it's like in these small changes, whether it's something about setting boundaries in your relationship, whether it's having a tough conversation with your boss, whether it's like facing difficult decisions that you have to make interpersonally with a friend that you know isn't pulling their weight in the relationship, right? There's like a million different ways that this can show up. You making that one small change has a cascade effect mm -hmm. because you're modeling then for everybody else that it's okay to make a different choice. It's okay to say no. I use the example in the book of Naomi Osaka, um, and Simone Biles, right? What they did for, for women, right? And it's no um, accident that this is black women that are kind of the ones who are showing us really. I, I, I don't know what their own personal journey is, but it looks a lot like real self-care to me, like setting the boundaries and stepping back despite the cost. Um, so getting back to your original question of owning your headline, right? So especially when it comes to my patient population, which is women and moms, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, I think one of the examples I used in the book was like, especially during the height of the pandemic, when everybody was really sort of drowning without childcare and everything that was going on, all the women were leaving the workforce. There was an article that came out that said something like women or moms get together in a field and scream because <laughs> they're so angry. And I, my example was like, well, why isn't the headline, like society completely betrays moms and they've had enough. Right. right. Like who gets to decide what the story is. Right. That is absolutely all about power. Mm -hmm. And so for us as as people who are kind of trying to like buffer ourselves from these systems and also like fight for what for, you know, like to be able to be fully human. Right. <laughs> in, in a world that makes it really hard to. That means that you have to tell yourself a different story. And and I think for me in writing this book, um, I had to model that for myself, like compassion with kind of having failed so deeply of leaving medicine and all the things that I went through and coming back and, and talking about it. Right. And knowing that, um, you know, that people were going to have opinions about me and, and that's OK. And and also that um, I have compassion for folks who have fallen into the woo woo world and have tried different things and knowing that, you know, the reason in particular for women, why we end up going to those places is because a lot of us have felt betrayed and failed by mainstream medicine. Um, and I think that there needs to be more modeling of sort of how do we be compassionate for ourselves and compassionate for others in this space. And so that was an example, I think in, in a lot of ways, this book is an example of me reclaiming my headline mm -hmm. and, um, 
uh, hopefully bringing out something that is more useful and productive. Well, I can only say I'm so excited for the cascade effect of what your book is going to bring everyone that comes across it. So thank you so much for you doing the work. We have time for a question from the audience. Um, so let's turn it over to Nicole's question. Nicole, thank you. When you are feeling down due to things going on in your life, for example, a breakup with a boyfriend, family issues, etc., what is one of the best self-care techniques to help lift you out of that mood? Yes, um, that is a great question. And um, as per usual, my psychiatrist response is going to be that, you know, I can't give you the answer because there's not always just one answer. There's lots of different answers, right? And it, depending on your situation. And so one of the things that I found, like what I hear this person saying is that, um, emotion regulation feels hard. Mm -hmm. So something that bad happens in my life, the circumstances feel difficult, are, are difficult, and it feels out of my control. And so I'm feeling sad, I'm feeling hopeless, I'm feeling down. Um, one of the things that we talk about at Gemma, my women's mental health platform is we have these courses and WhatsApp groups and community to kind of center these emotion regulation skills, right? So kind of getting outside of the really dark, sort of the, the, the hole that you might be in and reminding yourself that you do have agency and you do have choices. So, you know, I think that especially in that hard place, distraction is not a bad thing, right? Like if you have favorite TV show that you're just like, okay, this, this gets me out of my head, right? that's totally fine. Um, I think that relationships, like friendships, real friendships and community, like what we're building at Gemma, you know, it's like, if you have those people in your life that, you know, can be there with you and that help you feel good and are non-judgmental, that's really important. Um, you have to be careful there though, because you need to make sure that you're with people who, um, can actually support you and are not going to be critical or judgmental. Um, the other thing that I would say is that um, hope is also deeply important. And we talk, I talk about this in real self-care. We talk about this at Gemma on our, we have an, uh, a Substack newsletter that's called Therapy Takeaway. Um, me and my two um, founding partners at Gemma, who are also both psychiatrists, um, mm -hmm. we write this Therapy Takeaway Substack. And we talk about hope as um, it's a skill that you build. Right. So in what, what this person was saying is that I feel hopeless. Um, but can you remind yourself, can you remind yourself of times where things were better times when you, you felt like you had more confidence and bring back some of those memories that can sometimes help with hope too. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. We do have time for one more question. Thank you so much. So Sandeep, Sandeep asks, any recommended self-care when grieving? Yes, that is a great question. Um, so we know that there's different stages of grief, right? We know that there's the five stages. And so a little bit of this depends, a little bit of the answer depends on where you are in that stage. But I will answer for the person who is very deep in that um, very slow grief place that can look similar to depression, but is, it may not be depression, but is kind of a normative grief response. Um, the first thing that I would say is compassion is really important because grief in itself is, is a normal process. And especially if it's, if, if you've lost, if the person or the thing that you're grieving is something that was very, very important to you or close to you, then you should be in a period of mourning. Um, and, and, and that's something to honor and to allow yourself to be in that space. I think you have to know yourself though, as well. So, um, allowing yourself to be slow, but also implementing routine. So, in a period of mourning, you want to have some structures in place. So maybe it's like every morning you go to the same coffee shop 
and you say hi to the same sort of person that makes your latte. And that's the thing that you do every morning. And maybe it takes you like a lot longer than it would outside of this grief period, but there's comfort in having those kind of repetitive routines and the consistency. You get your lunch at the same place every day, right? You're having kind of like the same routine for dinner, right? And then depending on this person's situation, you do probably also still need to keep up with all the stuff in your life. Maybe you're still parenting, right? Maybe you have some time off of work, but maybe you eventually have to come back to work. So I think also lowering, lowering your expectations of your productivity yeah. and knowing that it's going to be slower. Um, so those are all just kind of a couple tidbits, I would say. And, and then to kind of implement that, you can kind of fall back on the four principles of real self-care. But I think like the consistency and the slowness and being okay with the slowness are the two things that I would sort of really highlight for that question. Thank you. Thank you mm -hmm. so much. And thank you to our audience for contributing those questions. Dr. Pooja Lakshman, where can we find you? How can we stay up to date with your work? Yes, absolutely. So the book is called Real Self Care. Um, it is available everywhere that books are sold, Amazon, Bookshop. And there is also an audiobook that I narrated. So if you prefer to listen to your books, you can get the audiobook on Audible. It's available right now. Um, and then uh, my company, Gemma, Gemma Women, we are building the masterclass of women's mental health. Um, our website is GemmaWomen.com, G-E-M-M-A. And we have courses for women, for people of color, um, also for professionals as well. Um, pregnancy, postpartum, and stress course that's coming up in the fall for um, healthcare providers and then also for women who are um, thinking about getting pregnant. So we have all sorts of offerings there. Um, and then I'm also on um, Instagram at Pooja Lakshman and, um, and I regularly speak as well. So you could reach out to me on um, my website to um, for, for speaking, consulting or advising. So. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. This was such a pleasure. It's the pleasure is ours. Thank you so much. I can speak on behalf of everyone here. It's been a true pleasure to speak with you and thank you for the work that you're doing. Absolutely incredible. Thank you so much. <laughs>